I proceed, I want to reiterate some things we've said before. I want to say them again for the sake of emphasis. They are so important. These points that I want to repeat are so important that I need to repeat them again to our hearing so we cannot take note of them. You've heard this. The things I'm going to say, you've heard them before, but I just quickly want to reiterate them. Number one, I want to remind us this evening that marriage is of God. Remember that we have established the fact that marriage is of God. From Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 25, where we read, we read that scripture severally during the course of this teaching. And we saw that it wasn't even the man who told God that he needed a wife. Remember, and it's it's important for us to remember this now because of what we're going to be discussing today. The man did not say, oh, I need a wife. It was God himself who decided that this man needs a wife. It is time for him to be married. And there's nobody for him. So I will make somebody suitable for him. Okay? And there are some lessons from that. I've said this before, but let me say it again. Okay? Now, remember I explained, I don't want to go through that explanation again, but I had explained that the man had existed for a variable period of time before God made that statement. We really don't know how long he had been living before that statement was made. But we do know that he had been living and if you, especially if you read Genesis chapter 2, we were told that God formed the man. And then after that, some other things happened and it, some interlude. And then God planted a garden in Eden. Then he now took the man that he had formed and put him in the garden. And like I explained then, when you read these things, it, it, it seems to you as if they're just happening second by second. But there may be some time in between these periods and we don't, really don't know. But... The man was not at any point declared to be needing a wife. Certain things were in place before God now decided that this man needs a wife. And there is nobody for him. So I will make. So the lesson for you from it is that it is marriage is a call. It is God that will tell you, not you, that it is time. It is time. You don't come up on your own and say, I think I am of age now. I have finished university. I now have a good job. I have bought my car and I have a house. Uh, In fact, one brother told me once that he has rented an apartment. All this where he used to live in, maybe one room or something. So now he has rented a two-bedroom flat and it is now time to marry. So what he did was he proposed to this sister. Then one week later, he proposed to the other sister because this sister has not yet answered. And a few days later, he proposed to the third sister. It's not hearsay, it's true life. Okay? (laughs) So that person lacks understanding of the fact that that is not why you marry. We're not going to go back to purpose of marriage. We've discussed that. And if you're not here, please get the messages. They're available. And we've discussed this in detail. But what I'm trying to say now is, who should marry is the person that has received the call to marry. Remember, what we are looking at is, who should marry? Okay? So, who should marry is the man or the woman that has received the call. So, I'm just reiterating some things, repeating certain things, uh, just to emphasize before I move on. Okay? I probably will refer to them again in the course of this of this um, class so if god has not nudged it in your heart if he hasn't spoken it or written it in your heart that it is time to marry you don't have any business getting married you know like for those of you who have been attending the class the many of the things we've said here are strange they are not normal people are going to quarrel with these things but it is the word of god that we are teaching like i told you Marriage, okay, that's the second point. When I get there, I'll say it again, and then I'll buttress the point I'm just making now. That any man, that man now, male man, proceeding on the adventure of getting married must come as a nudging from God. Is it clear? 
It should not happen because everybody says it's time. You know, I know that there are some brothers in the church now. People are always harassing you, how far, teasing you and things like that. That should not be the reason. Okay? Forget about all those. People will be people and they derive a lot of form pulling your legs. Okay? So people are going to pull your legs and say, ah, how far? How far? This one, that one, you know, they will talk to you like that. But that should not be, it shouldn't put you under any form of pressure. As long as you have not received any call, any nudging from God, any word spoken by God saying, you need a wife, then don't proceed. Just keep living your life, serving him, dedicating your, your, your life, your work, your affairs to him. Okay? Now, for the woman, you remember when God said, there's nobody found for him. I will make a helper suitable for him. So, for the woman, it is God who will make, who is, you know, I think that point is even for the man. It is God who will decide somebody that he has made for you. And it is God who brings the woman. You remember when God was going to make the woman? God made the man not to have any hand in it. Do you remember? The man was put to sleep. Assuming he was left to be awake, can you imagine what would be happening? He'll be interfering. Say, aha, are you making that leg? Hey, that type of leg you're making. That's not the type of leg I like. Oh. Say, do you think we can do it like this? Do you think we can do it like that? He will have a lot of opinions about that matter. Okay? But God just, you know, put him to sleep completely and say, and the, 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 the significance of that is just trust me. Trust me completely. I know what you need. The help that is suitable. I will not be suitable for another man. This combination of Pastor Chooks and Arichi works perfectly because we are suitable. <laughs> Somebody else could have married me and I will not be suitable for him and he will not be suitable for me. And there begins the journey of affliction. He could have married somebody who is not suitable for him. And he will not be suitable for the person. And there, he would have been on the journey of affliction. You remember he has even shared with us once that, of of course, I've been aware of that right from uh, days of courtship. And he shared it with you. That there was a lady he wanted to marry. In fact, he had even begun that relationship, but God told him over and over, this girl is not, I'm using the words of what we are talking about now, to paraphrase what God was telling him. Okay, what God told him practically is, where I am taking you to, this woman, this young lady does not have the capacity to carry it. So, if we are to paraphrase it in the terms we are using now, this lady that you are cutting is not suitable for you. It's not suitable for you. So, but you now, you don't know what is suitable for you. Do you know that? I hope you know. (laughs) Oh dear. A lot of people don't know that they do not know what is good for them. They think they know what is good for them. And that is why God asks us to Trust in me. You know, trust means rely on. Put everything completely. Just leave it to me. So, the problem, the reason why, you you remember last week we described what a typical marriage looks like. Do you remember when people get married, all the things that begin to unfold and all the unpleasantness. And the reason for this is because you did not know what was suitable for you. First of all, you looked at a person and said, ah, this person will be suitable for me. She looks beautiful. She's comported, composed, you know, lovely, speaks well, seems to be humble from a good family. She's a child of God. She seems to love God, but you don't know the person. I hope you know. You, I've already told you people, you can never know somebody until you start living in the same house with the person. You don't know the person. No matter, people have courted for 10 years. Somebody was sharing with me the other day in my office. He, he was discouraged like this marriage to himself. So I was talking to him. He said, no, it's not like that. He said, look at, oh, 
one of his relations, they had been in Koshi for 10 years. You think that after 10 years, they know each other, that their marriage is, is hitting the rock just one year into the marriage. So you don't know, I'm telling you, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know until you marry. So you now can never, I'm assuring you, you can never know what is suitable for you. You can't. You know when God said, I will make him, who was going to make somebody suitable? Is it the person that was going to look for the suitable person? When we say that you cannot marry without God talking about that matter, people think it's a joke. God said, I will make him a help. Suitable, suitable. So, it is God who will prepare that suitable person. And God brings her your way. As for the sisters, God will bring you to the brother. When you also begin to receive the nudging after God has made you. Remember we said God will have to make the person. After God has formed you and made you, he gives you that nudging. He brings you to the brother. Are we together? It is orchestrated by God. Purely, solely, wholly orchestrated by him. Okay, we need to move fast, so I'm not going to talk to that point too much anymore. But that first point I made is that marriage is of God, and it is an institution established by God himself, and not by men at all. Marriage was not the idea of any man. Even though marriage is a universal phenomenon, there's almost no culture in the world you will go to and you won't encounter marriage. Everybody has a tradition of how they marry. And when you want to marry, there's a procedure to follow. They, you know, when you come, they'll give you a list. You got, different cultures have a way they do it. It's in this part of the world they give people lists. I'm sure in other parts of the world, if you go to Europe, India, things like that, I don't know if they have a list. They may have a list of their own. Okay, but every culture, even if you go to the most remote places on earth, you will see that there's marriage. People don't just get up and start having children. They always marry and establish a family because it was established by God. Like I explained one time, if you see things that are established by men, they are not usually universal. You can go to some remote places. They don't have school because school is the idea of of man. Okay? But if you, if, if you go to that remote place, you will see marriage. Marriage is of God. The second thing I want to remind us of today is that marriage, because marriage is of God and was created by God, it is therefore spiritual. Marriage is spiritual. I've said this before many times. Marriage is spiritual and must be spiritually contracted. Marriage must be spiritually contracted. It must be contracted according to God's design. You know, if somebody has made something, he ha- you know, he has already put the technology within it to make it work. But there are rules, uh, there are set of instructions, or there's a manual, there's a standard operating procedure by which that technology will work. Are we together? Good. So if a product has been made, usually the manufacturer, the technology for that product to work effectively, efficiently, is usually installed within the product. But for you to enjoy and maximize the benefits of that product, you must utilize the product according to the standard operating procedure. Otherwise, the product will malfunction. Have you ever tried plugging um, an iron on a very low um, is it voltage or amp, power, the cord that you are connecting it to or the socket is not commensurate to the capacity of that iron. What will happen? It will melt. The cord will melt and the iron will probably start malfunctioning. But if you read the manual, you would have seen an indication of the capacity of voltage that you're supposed to connect that appliance to. Do you understand these plenty electrical things we are discussing? Good. You've experienced it now. 
Yes, you, in fact, in my house, they've blown up all my blown up all the sockets because they connected hand dryer and things like that. They're too heavy. Okay? Because they didn't follow the standard operating procedure. So those things start malfunctioning. That's exactly what happens with marriage. The manufacturer, remember we told you that God is the manufacturer, the the idea. It is his idea. It is his concept. So he has a standard operating procedure for how marriage should be run. Okay? But if you don't follow it, then you are not going to maximize the benefit of marriage. You would instead have a malfunctioning marriage that would bring a lot of pain to you, your children, your entire extended family and everybody. So it must be conducted the way God wants and it's a spiritual matter. That's what I'm telling you. Marriage is spiritual and must be spiritually contracted. It must also be run spiritually. So even after you have contracted the marriage and you've done it the way God wants and you get married, that's not the end though. That's just the beginning. You must run the marriage spiritually as indicated by God. Otherwise, you will end up like somebody who did not marry the way God wanted him to marry. So in other words, I'm saying that even though I am Pastor Chooks, we're so sure and convinced that God has led us to each other and has contracted this matter spiritually and has brought us together and has given us that call. If after we married, we just relaxed and said, thank God we are married and did not take time to run the marriage according to those same principles. We, we did not take time to run the marriage in a spiritual manner. Then we will end up like if he had married that other person, or if I had married somebody else. Did you get that point? Yes. So it's very important for you to note that it's not just about getting it right in terms of who to marry and all that. But even the way you are going to run the marriage, it must be run according to that standard operating procedure. The third point this evening, reminding us of what we've said before, is that marriage must therefore... Okay? So, as a result of what I have said in number one and two, consequent upon them, marriage must therefore be embarked upon only by spiritual people. So, only people who are spiritual should embark on marriage. It is to such people that the capacity to handle the intricacies of marriage has been given. Did you get that? Is it a complicated sentence? I said, only spiritual people should marry. You know, I told you that many of the things you are saying here will not sound, will not sound, you know, like what you've heard before or what people will usually say. But I'm telling you that marriage must be embarked on only by spiritual people who, because it is this kind of people that the capacity to handle the intricacies of marriage has been given. So, Marriage is not for children. Marriage is not for babies. Marriage is for matured men and women. Deeply spiritual people who are wholly and completely devoted to God. People who have consecrated and dedicated themselves to God. Did you get that? This is a very important point. So I'm just saying it very quietly, but it's probably the most, the, one of the strongest points I've made so far. Are we together? Good. Now, how will you feel if let me see who is a parent here with a child that is a little bit grown. Okay. Um, I can see Mrs. Omale. Okay, let's use Mrs. Omale. Yes, good. Mrs. Omale. How will you feel if one day comes to you tomorrow morning, very early around 5 a.m., knocks on your door? Say, mommy, I have something very important to talk about. He says, I want to marry. I have seen somebody that wants to marry me. And somebody has proposed to me. And uh, I have accepted. And I want to let you know. What will happen? Eh? Slap? It's not a slapping matter. Slap? Okay, laugh. 
you just be wondering what movie am I watching? <laughs> One this is it five or six years old? Five years old. In fact, I, my own teenage daughters, who, like I said, I cannot declare their age in the assembly of the brethren. <laughs> Otherwise, I will be held. In fact, I will be harassed thoroughly and be frowned and preached at and taught the demerits of such behavior. <laughs> so, but suffice it for you to know that they are teenagers. In fact, those younger, young teenagers, because when they say teenager, even 19 is teenager, these ones are not near. Am I in trouble? <laughs> So these teenage daughters of mine, if they, one of them comes and says that uh, the same thing one day we tell the mother, it will be a serious matter to be like, ah, what joke is this? But you know that every day people stand on the pulpit and get married and they are even younger than one day in the spirit. Do you remember during our third day anniversary, one of our speakers told us that some of you may have been born again for 30 years. When they check your age in the spirit, and say it's six months old. <laughs> no, there's spiritual maturity. Okay, we're going to come there. There's such a thing as spiritual maturity. Okay, and just like physical maturity, it's a definite point. It's not an arbitrary thing. It's a definite thing. We're discussing that in morning growth class for about two weeks now. It's a definite issue. It's not, it's not something that you say, okay, we are growing to maturity. Yes, we are growing. But there's a definite um, 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 reference for assessing whether somebody is spiritually mature or not. Are we together? Okay. So, marriage is not for children. It is not for babies. You can imagine somebody like Wandi or Stella Gold or, uh, or Che. Or even the t- young teenagers in our midst. Don't have any capacity. to. I mean, you can't even be talking about marriage near them. Isn't it? But people are, like I told you, every Saturday, loads of people are getting married. Who are just babies, some of them still wearing diapers. But they are 30 years old. They are 35. And they feel that because they are 30 or 35, it is time for them to marry. But they are spiritual babies wearing diapers. It's going to be a lot of war. It's going to be a journey of affliction for those people. Please, can you give us 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14? Marriage, like I said, is a spiritual matter. And when anything is spiritual, it can only be discerned by spiritual people. If you're not spiritual, you can't discern it. Remember we said marriage is a great mystery. But remember that God reveals his mysteries to deeply spiritual people. Okay? But... Can you give it to me? Yes, King James. No, NIV. Let's read it from NIV. NIV. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. Okay, so marriage is one of those things that come from the spirit, from God. And the manner in which marriage should be contracted and run are things that come from the spirit. Okay, but if you are not spiritual, You cannot accept, okay? Those who are not spiritual cannot accept those things. Anything that comes from the spirit, not only marriage, marital issues. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Did you get that? Spiritual things are what? Spiritually discerned. And we said that marriage is a spiritual matter. So, marriage can only be spiritually discerned. So, therefore, what kind of people should embark on marriage? Spiritual people who have the capacity to discern spiritual things. Now, we are addressing that matter. 
where Jesus, that matter Jesus raised in Matthew 19, which we will read shortly, when he told his disciples, when they were like, huh? If you say we cannot throw away our wives, this thing is too hard. Or marriage is not profitable nor desirable. And Jesus said, oh, you didn't know. Marriage is not for everyone. It is only those who are matured, who have the capacity, certain aptitude and grace. Some other translation, that was message, some other translation says, it is for those to whom it has been given or those who have the capacity. Now, we are already looking at people with that capacity. Okay, so spiritual people who can discern spiritual things. Now, if you're not deeply spiritual, if you're not spiritual, I don't even want to use the term deeply because you're either spiritual or you're not spiritual. There are Christians who are not spiritual. They are carnal. They are fleshly, and we're going to look at them shortly. If you're carnal, or if you're a fleshly kind of Christian, you are not spiritual. Marriage is not for you, because you cannot discern the things that the Holy Spirit is doing, and you will be out of tune with him. And it is being out of tune with the Holy Spirit that causes all those problems we, we heard about last week. Are we together? Yes, it is being out of tune with him. So if you're not spiritual, you can't be in tune. You'll be out of tune. You can't discern anything. And you just run your marriage aground. You cause a lot of tension and problem for yourselves. Okay, so marriage is not for children. Give us the amplified version of this scripture. Amplified. But the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God. For they are folly. They are meaningless nonsense. These, these are Christians who, okay? Christians who are not, who are living like natural men, carnal people, okay? The things of God are like meaningless nonsense to him. And he is incapable of knowing them He can't even recognize them. He says, of progressively recognizing, understanding, and becoming better acquainted with them. He has no capacity for that. When you are not spiritual, the technology that God puts inside spiritual people that helps them to recognize, understand, and be acquainted with spiritual things is lacking. Did you get that? That technology is lacking. And you just go, you, you, you can also assess yourself. Maybe times that you are not serious spiritually, you are just ignorant of all the spiritual things happening around you. Didn't know anything. You didn't have capacity to recognize anything. Because those things, those spiritual things, are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. Let me give you an example of this kind of thing we are talking about. I was at a wedding of a junior colleague some, I can't remember the month this year, maybe two, three months back. We were there with Pastor Truth, my husband, and we attended the wedding. And um, the person who preached the wedding message, he said something, I, I don't think I can forget that. That buttresses this point I'm going to make, this point I'm trying to make. Now, he says, He came home one day and his wife served him tasteless food. The food didn't have salt. So he sat down and he started eating and he realized there was no salt in the food. He got very angry. Apparently, this is a recurring decimal in the house from the way he said it. Not that he said so, but from my own perception of what he said. Because his reaction would not be commensurate to, you know, the fact that that was the first time Um, occurrence it must have been occurring because he really got angry so she she might just have that weakness she doesn't know how to put salt in her food and sometimes you may not blame her let me give you a background to some of these things she may have grown up with hypertensive parents whom the doctors have said don't eat salt so she has grown up and gotten used to cooking food with very little salt and all of them in their house now are used to you know our tests, our tests are acquired tests. I don't know how to explain it to you. 
Our taste are usually acquired taste. If you give birth to a baby now and you never give that baby sugar in his food, the baby will not even know about sugar. He will take his pap, take his gari, take everything without sugar and we enjoy it. The first time the baby will taste sugar, we probably will not want it. I had that experience with my first set of children. They didn't have any sugar in their food. So for long, they refused to eat sweet things. Now, when I tell them about it, they're like, how? You bring ice cream home, they will look at it and pass. Give them biscuits, they won't eat. If my husband will lament, how do you go out? You don't know what to bring for your kids. They won't eat though. You bring anything sweet near them, they will pack their biscuits into lunch box. They will bring the biscuits back home to you. Because they had an acquired taste. But with time, they started eating those things gradually and they now got another acquired taste. Now, if you give them, if I tell them, reduce the sugar, you see people murmuring. Mum, 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 mum. Okay, so, acquired taste, most, all the, the, the food you like is because you acquired the taste for it. Eh? I told you about, you know, go to another culture and see their food, you won't be able to eat it. Like Indian food. I think I've shared this to maybe in growth class. <laughs> When I was in the UK and I had a reading group, we were multiracial. So some of us were blacks, some, somebody was from Egypt, we had Indians, you know, just a number of us in that reading group. And we read together, study. And at a point, we decided to take turns bringing our food to, you know, we we'll take turns and bring our food and eat together. So if it is the Nigerians, we we'll bring Nigerian food and everybody will eat. So... The day the Indian brought her food, she told her, ah, she was the first person. Say we should not worry, she's going to cook all oh, something sumptuous. She made a lot of mouths. Then she now brought a huge cooler of rice. She said it's rice. She told us we like, we say, oh, we love rice. She brought the rice and the side dish. We were so, I didn't eat that day. We were so excited. We opened this rice and tasted it. And Jesus, the rice refused to pass. It just refused to pass. I had to get tissue and... There was no way. I said, I tried. I tried to find a pathway somewhere for that rice. In fact, my throat blocked. I said, don't even try it. That's what my throat was telling us. If you don't want me to suffocate you, don't even try swallowing that thing now. Because the mouth and the tongue we are shouting and warning the throat. What we are going through, you don't want to go through. You better warn her so that you don't experience it. <laughs> I could not. So I looked around and everybody was, ah, ah, people were, I can't describe that taste. You know, the, the young lady, the Indian lady, she was shocked. I said, what's the problem? We said, Kai, this food, is, we can't eat it. She said, Why? That this is a very delicious food. It is, ah, that she cooked it with her. We said, Kai, we are sorry, we cannot. This food is not passing. Some people were trying, but it was also not passing too. So she now said, okay, okay, let her make it better. Let her make it better. She now brought out yogurt. She wants to put the yogurt on top. <laughs> she, said, she didn't call it yogurt. She said, cod, cod. They call it cod. I let her put cord on it. She'll say, okay, if I put cord, it will taste better. So it's okay, bring the cord. Then lo and behold, it was yogurt. What are you talking about? You got on top of rice. What is this? <laughs> she says, it's a delicacy. It's a delicacy at home. Eh? Delicacy. But you see, this is what she has been eating since she was small. She has a taste for it. It is the best, most delicious food. Not so. For us, it didn't pass. Then when it was our turn, we're telling them, don't worry. Our own food, anyhow you are, you must like it. <laughs> That's because we, we like the food now. And the way it tastes in our mouth, we think it's the same way to taste in everybody's mouth. But all these people, they have what? Acquired taste. So we were, how many were we? Three or four Nigerians. So I was to cook. We, we cook different things. Somebody brought salad, a powerful salad like this. Coleslaw. In fact, to tell you how powerful that salad is, I still remember the taste. <laughs> Powerful salad. Then I think I made fried rice and jollof rice. So we made different things. Somebody fried plantain. We brought it. So happy. We're so confident. 
that these people no matter how will you not love fried rice and jollof rice? They came. This is how they were just taking it. They said this more. Okay, not bad, but they refused to eat more. It was just us that finished our food by ourselves. <laughs> and we are hailing each other. Ah, ah. Man, Fatih, this your salad is very nice. Eh? Ah, Arichi, this your rice, sweet. Where, where? Fide, this your plantain. It's only us that enjoyed our food. <laughs> The rest of them were just watching us eat. <laughs> they, I'm sure the same way my mouth and throat was reacting to that Indian food was the way there too was reacting to a very delicious food. So, acquired taste. And what took me there is a story I was telling you. That that lady, the wife of this pastor, probably has acquired taste for food that doesn't have much salt. And there will be a background to it. Perhaps she grew up with parents that didn't need salt in their food. And so that's how she cooks her food. And this pastor who is coming from somewhere else is not used to it. And he's like, this food is tasteless. He keeps complaining. And that particular day, they served him that tasteless food. He ate it and he got so angry. He spoke to her. He harassed her. You know, talked anyhow to her very rudely. And got up and left the house. So he was going out. He was at the gate. When the Holy Spirit said, is it my daughter? My own daughter. Hey, my daughter that you spoke to like that? Go back inside. How dare you open your mouth and talk to my precious daughter like that? Now, that is a spiritual matter. That is only spiritually discerned. If you marry a husband that is not spiritual, how will he descend such a thing? How? How? In fact, he will not only complain, he will beat you join. Let me speak Nigerian English. Beat you join and tell you things like you have not added any value to my life. These are things men have said to their wives. Say, since you can't even cook simple food to have taste, you cannot. What use do you have as a woman? You will say that kind of thing and then slap her on top and the child had two-year-old or five-year-old child maybe in the corner and you squeeze her cheek and slap her and go out. (laughs) They are laughing. It's true. It happens now. And you will go out. Then you cannot even descend. The Holy Spirit cannot even reach you. Did you see what they said? That he's incapable of knowing them. Incapable. He cannot recognize. He cannot understand. He cannot be acquainted. Do you know how many times the Holy Spirit speaks to us in marriage? Eh? What? There's no network for the person to hear. Because it's not spiritual. So you can imagine this man storming out of the house. Feeling righteously justified. And the Holy Spirit arrested him at the gate and said, my daughter. So, there are many lessons inside. Number one, you are you a daughter of God? Can God speak to your husband and say, my daughter, you cannot treat my daughter like this. Are you a daughter? Are you a, wo- a woman that God has formed? It's only a woman that God has formed that God can come and talk about like that. Too. You that you have not submitted yourself to him in consecration. He, you are doing your own thing. Him too is doing his own thing. Your husband does you anyhow. He'll be looking. Eh? Hey, is that what happened? Hey, yeah. <laughs> you don't know. It is you who is committed to him that he is committed to. That is what he says now. If you're committed to him, when you have arrived at a point in your life, so we are still talking about spiritual spirituality, not so, because it's a spiritual woman that the spirit can minister to her spiritual husband. About that kind of thing. Are we following? Are you getting the point? Yes. So when you are yaga yaga anyhow. You don't acknowledge God in your life. You do your things anyhow. So welcome now to the journey of affliction. When your husband squeeze your cheek. And and kick you. And push you to one corner. And storms out. You come and be crying. Father, father. You say, "Eh? (laughs) sorry. 
<laughs> and you may even be his daughter, a spiritual one, but you made a grave error and married a man that he cannot reach. You marry a man that he cannot reach. What, what is going to happen now? The same thing. The same thing. We just tell you, my grace is sufficient for you. Because the husband cannot hear. He said he is incapable of knowing. He won't even realize. But he will go out and even tell his friends and they will ginger him to come and do worse. But look at that man, a child of God, married to a spiritual woman, him himself spiritual. The Holy Spirit arrested him at the gate and said, is he my daughter? Do- <laughs> Are you okay? My daughter. And that thing taught him a lot that he cannot just open his mouth and talk to that woman anyhow. Because she's got a father. She's got a father. Hey. The father that will hook you like this. They hooked him at the gate. He had to go inside with his tail between his legs and apologize. He said he was even trying to do that type of, you know, that type of manly apology. He said, ah, is it that small thing I said that you are still vexing? <laughs> are, you, are you still vexing? Is it that? He was not allowed to give that type of apology. <laughs> he was not. He was not. Okay, I'm sure you're getting something from this. All right? So, yes. Marriage is not for babies. It's for spiritual people. Okay? I'm still trying to recap or reiterate things we've said before. Another thing I said, number four, is that because marriage is not the idea of men, yet it is a universal concept that all men go into in different parts all over the world, All our cultural prescriptions of how marriage should be contracted and run are all wrong. I've said this several times. Did you get that? That windy statement. What I'm saying is that marriage is not the idea of God. That's the first point I reminded us of. Sorry, it's not the idea of man. It is the idea of God, definitely, but not the idea of man. But because it is God's idea, it is planted in our spirit somewhere. And you go around the whole world, there's marriage everywhere. And people have a culture of how marriage, every culture has a way. In fact, there are marriage rights in every culture. Are we together? So the marriage rights describe how you should get a wife and how you should run your marriage. All of them are wrong. I've told you before, if you are a child of God, submitted to God's will, you cannot run your marriage the way your culture dictates or you're in trouble. This They are wrong. Why are they wrong? They are wrong because those prescriptions are not God's prescriptions. Where will you find God's prescriptions? In his word and by his spirit. Like that, don't talk to my daughter that way. Is it my daughter you talk to like that? You won't see it inside the Bible. But you will discern that one by the spirit. That's what the scripture is telling us. But only spiritual people discern such things. But the word is very clear, very clear about God's standard operating procedure for a marriage. The word is not silent about it. But most of our prescriptions from our cultures are not in accordance with God's prescriptions. Because they were the prescriptions of men or sometimes even the prescriptions of demons that rule over those cultures. And you now, you are a Christian and you want to subject yourself to that prescription. You, did you not hear the scripture tell you that whosoever ye submit yourselves to, to obey, servants or slaves of such ye are? So, the moment you begin to submit yourself to the prescriptions of your culture, you may be bowing down to a demon. Because demons are behind a lot of these cultures. Let me give you an example from my own culture, Aleku Ogbadigbo. Who is from Ogbadigbo in this place? Am I the only one? Ogbadigbo. Father Aleku is, is something that needs studying. If you hear, every day I keep hearing new, new prescriptions of, I, I, I don't know anything about Aleku. That's just the truth. I don't. He's a highly demonic, 
highly demonic stronghold and it holds Obadigbo men like this, whether they are born again or not. It is so bad. If you hear the prescriptions of this Alekwe, when you are married, I don't know all of just a little. When you are married, you cannot, uh, you, you and your husband cannot use the same sponge. You cannot use the same towel. You cannot bath together in the bathroom. Says Aleku. Says Aleku. Tell me, is he not a demon? They've even called it Aleku. Spirit. That's a, that's a literal meaning of Aleku. Aleku means spirit. This is the stronghold, the demon, the principality in control of Obadigbo issues. And you see Christians shaking up and down. Aleku. I say, ah. They'll say, hmm, forget that, you know, this thing. Even if you say you're a child of God and you don't follow that, it will still catch up with you. Because there are consequences of not doing what Aleku wants. So if you as a man now start using, doing some of those things Aleku says you should not do, you will stop prospering, you will get sick, and you may die. So Aleku wants to ensure that there's no intimacy between husband and wife. And people run. In fact, if you see how mother-in-laws, they are the chief enforcers of Aleku because they don't want anything to happen to their son. So they will come around the house. Eh? Are you betting with that woman? Can you imagine? You are all surprised at Aleku. You have your own in your culture. It may even be worse than this. All manner of things. In Alekwe, the woman doesn't have any say, no nothing. Even if she's working like this, eh, she, if, when she collects her salary, ah, there's nothing. In fact, Aleku is something. Do you know that you can drive your wife away from your house, but her salary is still your own, according to Aleku. You will come every month and collect the salary. I just didn't have time. Today was very, very hectic for me. But while I was preparing the message, I, you know, heard clearly that under direction from the Holy Spirit to really make it known to you that your cultures are wrong. And the example that came to my mind was Aleku. So I wanted to call some of my aunties that they should give, tell me all those things Aleku demands. But there was no time. I had to rush down. If you hear the demands of Aleku, your ears will, will tingle. And according to Aleku, if you suspect that your wife is unfaithful, don't eat her food. If you eat her food, you will die. So now, a lot of people hide under Aleku when they don't want their wife again. Say, Kai, I am not understanding her movement. I believe that she's having some funny, funny interactions with other men outside. So therefore, I shall no longer eat her food. And I think she should go back to her parents' house. Once you talk like that, nobody will argue with you. Hey, your mother will run there and pack the woman's things because she does not want anything to happen to her son. And people are under this bondage. There's nothing like even secret between you and your wife. If anything is happening, you go and ask. You have to ask the elder. Should we do like this? Your woman was telling me this her story. A patient of mine, I almost wept with her. Young lady married her husband, but her leku is the altar inside their house. When she got pregnant, they said that the elder said she should not go for that. That antenata she's attending, she should not go there again. She shouldn't go to that hospital. Uh-uh. If you see the way this Aleku rules the va- and they are so afraid, so they didn't go. When she was now in labor, they said this is the place she should go. They took her there. She was laboring under the instructions of the people of Aleku. She labored and labored and labored. Labored and labored, baby will not come. Labored and labored, baby will not come. For hours. Before somebody said, oh, if this woman dies here now, what are we going to say? Let's just go to the hospital. So by the time they got to the hospital, the doctors were lamenting. They did the operation. They brought out a dead baby. She had been in labor for so long. She got infected. She battled with infection for more than a month. She was on admission. But the saddest thing now is that this is almost three or four years later. She can't conceive. So that is how she came to me. And by the time I assessed her, everything is spoiled because of that infection. Under the supervision of Aleku. 
I don't know what they call it in your own place, but you all have this kind of terrible cultures that tell you how to run your marriage. There's this the way we do. Sometimes they won't even link it to a spirit, but they'll say in our place, so this is the way we do. That's the way we do. Even simple, simple things like in Thief land, it is women that pound yam. Uh, uh-uh. Is it not true? So simple, simple, small, small things that you don't know that there's one demon controlling those things. Say it, it is women that, that pound, it's women that pound, that men don't enter kitchen. If you enter kitchen, that's demonic. Highly demonic. One of my friends from Plato, he said, in fact, if a man enters kitchen, there's a course that we follow him. I said, Jesus, these demons, they were very mischievous. Very mischievous demons. To just make sure that you frustrate people. You put up such things. So they are so afraid of going to kitchen. So him now, when he was growing up, there's nothing like entering kitchen, nothing. You come back now, even if you're hungry, you can't enter the kitchen. You'll be waiting for your sister or your mother, they'll come and give you food. Because you don't want to be cursed. Then, he now went to a mission school and went to a mission school and because of encountering missionaries, he changed his mindset. So by the time he married his wife now, he's always in the kitchen with the wife there, enjoying himself. So if he goes back to the village, the father will be saying that he should come and participate in some cultural rites. He say, ah, me that I'll be entering kitchen. If I go there and I die, you. <laughs> so the father will insult him and say, you're not a man. <laughs> you know, different cultures, they are really horrible cultures. Okay? Horrible. They are highly demonic. And I tell you that demons, principalities, and rulers, rulers especially, are behind these cultures. So any prescription they come up with concerning marriage, it is definitely not in accordance with God. Okay? All right. Number five, marriage is not for everyone. We have said this over and over. We are going to read a scripture that points to that. Number six, you can marry, you. Ah, you, you heard what we said all the while, that marriage is spiritual, it's only spiritual people that should embark on it, and even if you are spiritual, God must call you, he must put a nudging of marriage in your heart before you embark on it. Do you remember that? Yes, and the woman will be presented to you. You don't have any part in it. God prepares it and presents it to you. You may choose to agree or not. After all, people marry every day. Not so. Unbelievers, Christians who are not serious, all manner of people marry every day. So anybody can marry for any reason they want to marry. We can't stop them. We can't, we can't do anything about it. But if you want a marriage that works, if you want a marriage, you know, that relationship, that love that God has for the church, that relationship between Christ and the church, The Bible has likened marriage to that kind of arrangement. If you want your marriage to look like that, if you want a marriage that is characterized by peace, a marriage that God can manifest himself through, if you want that kind of marriage, then you must do it God's way. You don't have a choice. Anything short of that, you are on a journey of affliction. The devil doesn't have anything to offer you. If you follow your culture, then the way it happens in your place is how it will happen. If you follow societal ideals, societal prescriptions, then you will have society marriage. You know society marriage? Good. Where nothing works, but everybody is pretending that it is working. So there's no two ways about it. If you want to do it God's way, then you follow his prescription. We already started looking at some of them. The first one we said is that the person must be born again. So God's prescription is what we are talking about now. The person must be born again. We've talked about this. I'm not going to go there again. We read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 to 17. 
where we heard about unequal yoking. And I said, the person must be able to describe a definite salvation experience. You remember? Okay, so somebody will say, ah, they, they cannot define definite salvation experience because they had plenty, plenty rededications. Okay? But at least you can remember all the dedicate. You, can, you know that you were rededicating, then you rededicated, then you rededicated, and now... <laughs> that's why I said you will be able to explain the salvation experience and your subsequent work with God so your subsequent work with God will surely be characterized by several rededications okay then where we stopped and where we are continuing now is that the person must be a true believer the person must be a true believer And I started introducing us to a concept of people who are born again quite all right, but are not truly believers. I don't know how to put it. When I say they must be true believers, they must be genuine believers. I I don't want to suggest that. Oh, yeah, but the Bible is quite clear about it, so let me not um, put my own there. Some people are believers, but they are not true believers. What's the opposite of true believer? Fake. No. Fake. Fake believer. Hmm? Phony believer. Phony as in P-H-O-N-Y. Eh? Fake believer. Phony believer. Which other adjective can we use there? False believer. I heard one recently from one of our daddies. Counterfeit believer counterfeit fake phony counterfeit okay these people are born again quite all right they are born again (laughs) unreasonable they are born again quite all right but they are not consecrated to god okay now there are two people to make it easy there are two classes of people that fall into this description of counterfeit believer or fake believer One, some people are not Christians at all. That's as in they've not even become born again. Okay? But they come around and pretend to be born again. So that's one class. You will not know. I will show you how to know. They will be in the church. They know that they are not born again. And they don't want to be born again. But they came around to look for wife or husband. There are many of them in the church looking for husband. Many. Many young ladies, they are not born again. They've never surrendered their lives to Christ. But they believe that a good man is what's one. A good man is what I need. They've looked around the marriage of their parents, the marriage of their sister. Ah, In the church, there'll be good men who will be different. So they come, package themselves, join one department. Hmm? They'll quickly go and do once they hear the announcement. Join a department, but you must do foundation class. Ah, is that all? Ah, foundation class, here I come. <laughs> they join, do their foundation class. What next? Growth class? Brrr. They are saying, chai. Somebody is lamented, chai. Because you can't believe that somebody will be doing foundation class and growth class and not be born again. Very possible. Then we finish and quickly join one department. And usually... They will join one department where it will be obvious that they are serving the Lord. I'm not castigating any department. Please. I didn't mention any department. They didn't mention. Why are you people mentioning? Eh? Okay, so they will join the department and they will be very serious. Okay, they will join all departments but prayer, says Pastor Chooks. Because if they join prayer, they will get born again. They will get born again. They will also not join children's department because the brother will not see them. Unless the brother they are eyeing is a member of children's department. Then they will quickly join children's department. (laughs) So we can safely look at our children's department and say, okay, there's no such person there. Because the brother there is already married. (laughs) 
Yes, but it's not only a sister that can behave like that, even a man. In fact, I think the, the, we, we understand that men do that more. But you didn't understand that ladies do that too. And so they come around. They are, they are not even born again. Then we have the second class of people who behave like that. They are born again. But have refused to submit to God. They have given their lives to Christ too. But they have refused to submit to God. They have refused to submit to God. These are people who do not want God to have his way in their lives. And there are many people like that in the church. In fact, somebody says 80% of people in the church are like that. They come to church. Oh. They come to church. They attend services. They attend all programs. But they don't want God to have his way in their lives. They don't understand. They've not, according to pastor, they are not reasonable. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him, which is your reasonable service. So when you come to that point, where you become reasonable, you, you, you realize that at this point, God bought me. You remember that scripture pastor shared with us, Second Corinthians 5.15? You can put it up. Second Corinthians 5.15. He says that somebody died so that the people who are now living will no longer live. And he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The Bible says we have been bought with a price. You are no longer your own. Therefore glorify God with your body. His scriptures are very clear about the very next step after you become born again. You need to get to that point where you say, yes, I have been bought with a price. And somebody died for me. Now I can no longer live the way I want. And then you submit yourself to that person. So that is the point of being reasonable. When you cannot do that or have not done that, you are not yet reasonable and God cannot reason, to, reason with you. Okay. So, a lot of people, they practice Christianity quite all right, but they exclude consecration. They don't understand that when you become born again, you don't have any will of your own anymore. You, that is how you are supposed to be. You have no will, you have no agenda. Many people don't know this so. This is a, a truth that is cast in the body of Christ. You thought that when you became born again, you became born again for God to meet your needs and give you breakthrough. That is what you are being taught popularly. So we have a lot of Christians who are living for their breakthrough. They are living for their advantage. And they have learned, in fact, they are being taught how to take advantage of God's resources. God has many resources, grace, the Holy Spirit, so many resources that are at our disposal. But people are trying to use these resources for their selfish agenda, which is usually self-gratification, self-actualization, and realizing their ambitions and all of that. Are we following? It is about breakthrough. It is about results. It is about this and about that. And that is the way a lot of Christians, as I'm talking, I'm researching your heart. Do you understand what it means to submit yourself to the will of God and have no agenda? No agenda whatsoever. You don't have any will of your own. That is the, those are the kind of people we call dead men and dead women. You are dead because your will is not standing in the way of God anymore. But many of us, hey, eh, our will is standing very tall. When God appears, the will will stand up. Anything God says, your will will say, what if? In fact, God can't even reason with you. Many times he won't even talk to you. And we saw this when we read even that Matthew 19. When the people were saying, ah, but Moses allowed the people to divorce. What did Jesus tell them? Because of the hardness of your you refuse to submit to God so he allowed you to do what you want 
We have a lot of believers like that. Like I said, somebody said majority of Christians are like that. They are carnal. Eh? You know, the hallmark of carnality is that you do things the way your desire wants you to do them. You do things the way society wants you to do them. You do things the way your family wants you to do them. These are the hallmark of carnality. You, are, you, don't, you, are, you, are, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. It is so important to you how you appear. You want to appear before men the way men will rate you. That is so important to you. You want to meet with men's definition of what it means to be a cool person. And you disregard the requirements of God. You don't even acknowledge him. A lot of you here, do you even ask the Holy Spirit... What should I do about anything you want to do? Some people don't know that dimension in their lives. They don't know that you cannot just get up and do anything. That every single thing you are doing is on that direction. And let me tell you, until you bring yourself to that place, you cannot experience God. You cannot experience the supernatural. It is in that place of consecration and dedication, that the power of God is unleashed. We sang before we started the service, Oh Lord, manifest yourself. It's in the place of your alignment. It is when your spirit, soul, and body stand in alignment with the spirit of God, that the power of God will be focused through you, and you can manifest him. But when you, you, you are, the Holy Spirit is here, you, you are there. Your body is in another place. No alignment. And that is how many Christians are. We are so concerned about the cares of this life. We are so concerned about the, the rigors of daily living. We are so concerned. We are worried about our future. We are worried about what people will say about us. We are worried about looking presentable, looking good in people's eyes. All manner of things. We are just behaving exactly like Peter. When Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you do not have the things of God on your mind, but the things of men. So in your decision making, what do you, who do you consult? You know the way the children of Israel lived in the wilderness? They don't move until God moves. That is how we are supposed to be as Christians. You know the priests in the Old Testament? That is how they were consecrated. The Bible tells us today that we are a royal priesthood. God, this is what God really wanted to do, to raise a people who are priests. You are a teacher, but you are a priest. You are a tailor, but you are a priest. You are a doctor, but you are a priest. You are a wife, but you are a priest. You are a mother, but you are a priest. You are a father, but you are a priest. You are a student. A priest student. That's what God desires. And what do priests do? Offer sacrifices to God in righteousness. And that can only be possible in the place where you have submitted yourself to the will of God. Anything short of that, you are a counterfeit believer. Anything short of that, you are a fake believer. What are the other words we use? false, false believer. And how do you know these people? People who just do their own things. No, I have plans, I have plans, I have plans. Are they God's plans? These are my plans. I'm getting up, I'm going there. You, so, it takes a certain depth of dedication and consecration to get to where I'm saying. It will sound like Greek to many of you listening to me because you just get up and do your own thing. You did not know that you have been bought, that you are no longer your own. Give us Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 23. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 23. So, we, I, if you are this kind of believer, you need to come and submit yourself to God. You are not even the type that should marry. We are even warning people that they should look out for your type and not marry. So if you are looking at yourself and saying, wow, 
I'm just the type of person who does my own thing. I've never known that I'm supposed to submit to God. You are hearing today. And God desires you to submit yourself to him. Okay, so how do you recognize this kind of people? Matthew, let's read it from New Living Translation. New Living Translation. How do you recognize these people? Matthew 7, 15. New Living. Beware of false prophets. Okay, so false believers. False prophets. Counterfeit believers. Fake believers. All those terms, eh? Okay. Who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves is that new living translation my own new living translation reads differently from what i'm reading maybe i should read it from my you can keep that one up but i would like to you know there are different editions of of one translation so you could have that happening i have probably have a different edition from what you have okay He says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really wolves that will tear you apart. It was that tear you apart I wanted you to see. So a lot of people get married to wolves. Female wolves as a wife. Some people have, what is a female wolf called? Well, she wolf. Eh. (laughs) Somebody says she was. Some people marry the wife that some people have married is a wolf who is tearing them apart. And the husband that some women married, marry a husband that is a wolf and is tearing you apart. Okay? All right, continue. Verse 16. Now, how will you know this kind of people? Verse 16. Go, move, move, move quick. No, give us your own. He says. You can, you can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Okay, so you can't pick mango from orange tree. And you cannot pick pineapple from apple. You know, my, these children that grow up in this town, they don't know, can't recognize plants. Are you aware? I was so shocked the day I was showing my daughter that seed tomato plant. She said, hey, is it tomato? So it occurred to me that ah, these children, do, if they see plants, they can't recognize them. Okay, but we, when we were growing up, we were closer to nature. We went to farm and things like that. So if you see orange tree, you know orange tree. You know mango tree. You know all of them. Granite plant, corn. So the only way that those my daughters know that this is mango trees when they see mango fruit. Because by they can't look, if you look at the leaves or the tree, can't, they, can't, they can't recognize. But I think maybe now they are older. I believe that Ruhama and Daniela can now, but I still doubt if Stella good. Until she will see the fruit, then she will know that, okay, this is a mango tree and this is orange tree. But you, there was a time when these ones, you'd be showing them, this mango tree, eh? Especially when it doesn't have any fruit on it. Say, eh? To just, I'll just be marveling. Say, ah, ah, what are we doing raising these children inside town like this? You sure I won't bundle them too. <laughs> but I believe they know corn plant now because they planted corn this last, this season that just finished. And they harvested them and ate. So I'm sure if they see a corn plant, they can recognize it. So you can relate with this scripture. That you can identify those kind of fake believers by their, which is the way they act, the way they behave. Move on. Likewise, okay, a good tree produces good fruit. And a bad tree produces bad fruit. Now, that verse 17, we are going to look at it from different translations. Now, using our fake believer, hmm, a good tree. So, the tree is referring to believers. eh? So, a good believer or a genuine believer produces good fruit and a bad believer. So, another word for those fake believers is what? Bad believer. Okay. Go to Amplified on this very scripture. 
amplified on verse 17. Okay, so even so, every healthy, sound tree. So when you are a true believer, you are a healthy, sound believer. Sound believer. So in other words, what we are saying is that marry a sound believer. Sound. Healthy one. So such trees bear good fruits, worthy of admiration. But the sickly decaying worthless tree bears bad worthless fruit. So those believers that are not true believers are sickly believers, decaying believers, worthless believers. And they bear what? Worthless fruit. Okay? Let's look at King James translation, rendition of this verse. It says, a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So we have corrupt believers. I'll be writing it down. These are the kind of people to avoid. Let's look at um, NIV. NIV says bad, eh? I think NIV says bad. Bad. Okay? The New Living Translation that I have in my own my device says unhealthy. An unhealthy tree produces bad fruit. Unhealthy. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's continue our reading according to New Living Translation, verse 18. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Did you see that? And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. No capacity. Verse 19. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, verse 20. Thus, by their fruits. Okay, yes, the way to identify a tree or a person is by the kind of fruit that is produced. So this one says, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Okay, go to go, switch over now to NIV. NIV translation. And we continue. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Continue. No, we are continuing at verse 21. 21, not from the beginning. Okay, so not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, we enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Did you see that? So we have a lot of believers saying, Lord, Lord. But the Bible says they will not enter. They won't enter. They won't enter into the kingdom. They won't have a part in the kingdom. You know, there's one thing to see the kingdom. There's another thing to enter. Do you remember Moses? Did he see the kingdom? Did he enter? Some people say he entered much later on the Mount of Transfiguration for a brief period. But he never lived there. He never entered. Who are the kind of people who enter the kingdom and experience everything God has? What kind of people are those? Those who do the will of my father who is in heaven. Did you see that? So we have a lot of people in church speaking in tongues, doing all manner. Calling him Lord, Lord. You say Lord, but you don't do the will of God. Is it not like what pastor shared with us when God appeared to Peter in a dream and said, kill and eat. And he said, no, Lord. And they say, no, and Lord, don't go together. You can't call somebody Lord and say no to the person. Say no, Lord. So apparently we have a lot of believers who say no to God on daily basis. That's what this scripture is telling us. That they say, Lord, 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 Lord. But they don't do the will of God. And what did the Bible say about such people? They will not what? They will not enter. They won't experience the kingdom. Say, only he who does the will of my father. You see what we're talking about? Consecrating yourself and having no will of your own. And doing only what? The will of the father. Okay, go on to verse 22. 
He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? So, a prophet is not the person you will marry. The fact that somebody is prophesying is not what qualifies the person to be married. The fact that the person is singing powerfully and the power of God is coming down is not akin to spiritual maturity. The fact that the person can preach and share when they start sharing, that is not what determines spiritual maturity. He says that people will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Can you? You need to picture this. Do you know anybody now that is so highly anointed, prophesies, gives word of knowledge, and does miracles, drive out demons, and people are rushing up? Don't we know people like that? But it is very possible for people to be like that. And they are not doing the will of God. Can you believe? (laughs) All right, move on. Move on. Move on. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now look at it from New Living Translation, verse 23. So Jesus called those people evildoers. He said, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. In my own edition of New Living, it says, but I will reply, I never knew you. Go away. The things you did were unauthorized. Even your prophecy and your miracles and the signs and wonders we are unauthorized. So you have somebody who is anointed but is not under the authority of God. The issue is it's not can you, it is should I. This statement I made now, do you understand it? The issue is not can I do this? The issue is should I do this? Somebody said that when you have asked the question, can I do it? You must ask the question, should I do it? And those are the people who are under God's authority. You know, that was the issue when the devil came to tempt Jesus. When you are young, I remember when I was much young, I never understood why was that thing a sin? When they came and told Jesus, turn, if you know you are the son of God, turn, are you not hungry? Turn stone into bread. And that, that was a, a temptation. When I was much younger, I couldn't understand why it was a temptation. After all, we turn things into food on daily basis. You go into your kitchen, you carry unedible rice and turn it into rice, edible rice, because you are hungry. That's, that rice looks like small, small stones. But by the time you cook them, turn it into food and you eat. So I asked myself, what was the crime? In performing a miracle and turning that stone into bread. After I was hungry. But as I grew and I matured, I understood that the question is not, can I? The question is, should I? He has the power to turn stone into bread. But should he? Now, why should he not? Because the suggestion came from... Because... To him that you yield yourself to obey, slaves of him are you. And that was the mistake Adam made. He yielded himself to the devil. He obeyed the suggestion of the devil. Slavery ensued. So when the suggestion is coming from the devil, it is very obvious that you can, but you should not. Even when the suggestion sounds legitimate. Is this in ministry anything to any of us this evening? So, the suggestion came from who? The devil. Are you matured enough to know when suggestions are coming from the devil? Have you gotten to that place? When you can sense him and say, this is the devil talking. I refuse that suggestion. Because if you yield to that suggestion, what do you do? You become a slave. Of the devil. At least for a time being. <laughs> for a th- okay, Uncle Ima said throughout that day. <laughs> Ima Abba said it's throughout that day you become. Okay.
Okay, so people are unauthorized. The Bible tells us very clearly that fake believers are very obvious to detect. That you detect them by what? By their fruits. And the fruits are so many. Okay? With just in the next five minutes I have, let's look at a few of those fruits. First Corinthians 5. We've read this one. Let's just read it again. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 to 11. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 to 11. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Verse 10. Not at all, meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. Okay, move on. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral. So are you seeing some of those acts? Are you seeing those acts that show forth the fake believers? Yes. And Apostle Paul was telling you that these kind of people don't associate with them. I'm not talking about unbelievers in the world. Though. You know, we've described this scripture before. These ones are inside the church with you, but they are what? Fornicators, adulterers, sexually immoral. And I use this opportunity to tell you, if you are in a relationship with any brother, you thought that this is the will of God, and the brother starts pushing for sex, you do what? You put an end to that relationship immediately. If she starts demanding sex, what do you do to that sister? Eh? You do what? put an end to that relationship immediately. That person is a fake Christian. He's an unhealthy Christian. You don't want that kind of person as a wife or husband. What of greedy people? Idolaters, slanderers, gossips. I've told you, gossip is very destructive. It can wreck a family. It can wreck an institution. It can wreck a church. If you know anybody inside this church that does the work of gossiping, just mark the person with red mark. Just use red biro and put a mark on the person's forehead. And it's not only in this church, in your office. Don't join gossips. If, you do, if, you, if, you're, if you're consecrated and dedicated, you cannot gossip. Here is a place for that one. It's not just gossip. Oh. These people are slanderers. They can go top 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 that 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 ah. And we have them in church. We have them in church. They will just cause tension all over the place. The Bible says, it, the Bible identified them slanderers, drunkard. So the person still drinks. It's a swindler. That's another set of people. They are in the church too. Plenty. Sometimes they even try to swindle the church and swindle the pastor. And sw- a lot of stories. So. You know how they do it? They come with stories. This one has done that, that happened to this, and this happened to that. And so dear for this. So that you will give them, you give them welfare. You know, some people have stories 247, there's always a story. Swindlers. Some people will collect your money, promise you they are going to make something for you. Two years later, you can't see the money, you can't see the thing they are making, you can't see the person. And there are brothers and sisters in the church. The Bible says, with such a man, do not even, don't even eat. And some of you want to marry them. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 to 8. I'm just running through them now. I've explained some of these things before. But I just want to buttress the fact that you can identify these people by their fruits. Your eyes must be open. No? Young people are always saying, how do I identify red flags? These are the red flag. When somebody say, starts touching you on your bum bum. Eh? That is a what? Give this to me from King James. King James. Romans 8. Quickly, quickly. For to be carnally minded is death. 
But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So Christians, we have a lot of Christians who are carnally minded. Move on, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity with, against God. You know that carnal mind is that mind that does not want to submit to the will of God. Does not even want to know the will of God. For it is not subject to the law of God. You see that? I was just describing it. So the carnal mind is enmity against God because it is not subject to the law of God. People that are not under authority, eh? they are not under authority. Neither can they even be. Verse 8. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And like pastor said, if they cannot please God, they cannot please you. So, Christians that are carnally minded, everything they do, they look at everything from carnal perspectives. And you know people like that. Those are not marriage materials. Then Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. So, so many, so many works, bad fruits are listed here. The acts Give it to us from, let me read verse 19 from King James so that it can link very well with Romans 8 verse 6. Now the works of the flesh. Okay, so these are works of the flesh. Those, these works of the flesh are manifested by Christians. So we read in Ephesians 4 the other day in morning growth class that you should no longer live as the Gentiles do. So there are believers who live as the Gentiles do. And these sort of believers are the ones we are calling fake believers. And they are not marriage material. So what are, how do you know them? Matthew told us that you can recognize them by their works. But their actions, the way they do things. Look at it here. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Okay? You cannot go to NIV. Let's see idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, temper. If you've got a temper, you are not qualified to be married. I think I told you people this thing the other day. If you have a temper, hot temper, don't marry yet. Oh. Go and lie down in the oven of God. Let the refiner's fire refine you. That's, you will go and lie down there by yourself. Pastor said, don't stand up. Don't stand up. Just lie down there. It may take a while. It may take a year, two years, three years. Stay there. Don't marry. One of the easiest traits to show up in marriage is what? Rage. Rot. Even people that didn't have it before, they may develop it too. Because of the intricacies of marriage. So you that you already have it. And you know. You know. And you want to marry. And you. You know that that person you want to marry. Has bad temper. What is wrong with you? That you want to go and marry that person. And you know. (laughs) pastor said, you people have gone somewhere before and the person got angry and abandoned you there. And you still fixed wedding date. You will go and lie down inside oven. Eh? You know he says that he will purify us with fire. Just carry yourself there, judge. Don't wait for him to come first. Just come and say, Baba, See me here. I need purification. Where is the oven? I lie down now. (laughs) Let him use his refiner's fire and refine you and make you presentable. Selfish ambition. You see what we're talking about? You know some people, you, you you are in a relationship with somebody and all the person has are selfish ambitions. The person does not think about the things of God. You know, I've, I told you that I dodged many people. Do you remember me telling you that I dodged eh, with my life like this? I, because I knew these things. I encountered men of many varieties like this. 
Is it anger? Once you demonstrate that anger, eh? I told you, you won't see me again. I won't even answer you. You won't even know why I'm no longer answering you. That's the worst part. Because how do I start telling you that it's because of your bad temper? You will start explaining away. And sometimes they didn't even show me the bad temper. I, they were always very nice to me. But I saw them displaying it around to everybody else. So I'm telling myself, am I foolish? In the next three months, I'll just be like these other people. When I'll no longer be a new item. That is three months after the marriage, but then the lot is meeting out to all these people. We'll be my lot, so please go and work on yourself. God bless you. When God has worked on you and he nudges you, he will present you your wife. But right about now, I am not the one. <laughs> that was how I was dodging. You know? huh? I dodged. Selfish ambition. Kai, that type, I met them. Two men inside church. You saw them, you thought that they were serving God like you. You only realize that you are the only one that has a mind for God. That's why his mind is not... He, He's even the pastor's PA. I met one like that. He was my pastor's PA. My pastor's PA, I was seeing him from a distance and admiring him. Oh, lovely young man. So dedicated. So zealous. Always. <laughs> a lovely guy. Seems hardworking and everything. So, as I was just eyeing him from a distance, he also started eyeing me. Then he came around and I was like, wow, thank God. <sighs> now I can, we can, uh-uh. but I'm trying to relate. He has not proposed to me yet though. I'm trying to relate. Uh, I wasn't understanding. But I wouldn't mind our things of God and somebody else is talking about that. Uh, what are you even talking about? He's full of plans. When I ask, what does God want you to do? Say God. God has blessed all his ways. All, the, all his works and everything are blessed. Okay, but is it what God wants you to do? What God wants him to do? What am I talking about? These are the things he wants to do. And he has told God and God is going to bless them. We are not on the same page. Oh. He has ambition, all manner of ambitions. Is it what God wants you to do? He does not, cannot answer that question. So I said, okay, bye-bye. I didn't tell him the bye-bye like that. He just stopped after service. Usually you want me to wait after evening service like this. We all go together. But suddenly, ah, you won't see me again. While he's attending to pastor, I have escaped. So he was not just see me, not just see me. Went and told pastor he wants to marry me. Pastor said, yes, yes, that's your wife. (laughs) By the time he came around, I refused to answer him. The pastor was now lamenting that I turned him to false prophet. And now told pastor, this man that you are telling me to marry, do you know him so? The pastor was just looking at me. He he's your PA, but it's like you don't know him. In fact, I felt the pastor didn't know anything about him because all the things I saw about him, Kai. <sighs> I just knew that this one is not. Just go, God will work on you. All the best. Move on to verse 21. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Disorderly behavior. Eh? That's a summary of drunkenness and orgies. People that are disorderly. They don't submit to authority. You have somebody in your department, a worker, and he's always fighting with the HOD. Just mark that one with X like this. If HOD say A, he will say B. Disorderly people. They are not submitted to God. They do things as they like. They behave anyhow. They don't have... They... Hmm. <laughs> By their fruits, you shall know them. And the apostle says, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's one sister I knew once. She said she, this guy came around for her. They were considering the matter. 
whether they will marry each other. And one day, they went to a, a program, went for a program in a church, or maybe their church. And it was time for offering. And she brought out her offering to give. And the brother was shocked. Say, what is that? You want to give this amount of money? You want to give this amount? As in, he could not understand that she wants to give that amount. As in, you will come and give. This is the kind of offering you give. No, but when he, when he, when she now understood that when she marries that one, she will not be able to give the way God is laying on her heart to give. Because this man does not understand. He does not have understanding. Because they are spiritually descend. By the time God is telling you, empty your bank account. But when you come and tell, if, if you are a husband or a wife, and the Holy Spirit is telling you, empty your bank account. You know because of the rules God has put in place. If it is the wife that he heard that, she should not just go and empty the bank account. She has to come and tell her husband that this is what I'm receiving. Now, if it is the Holy Spirit speaking, he has also spoken to the husband. If he is spiritually discerning. Remember we talked about that at the beginning. That spiritual things are spiritually discerned. That has happened between me and my husband severally. By the time he's opening his mouth to say the instruction, I'm saying it. We are saying it together. But, so, wife, it's not appropriate for a wife to say the Holy Spirit said, then go and empty the account without telling the husband. Because of the standard operating procedure we've been given. Now, husband, the Holy Spirit is saying, empty your account. It's also wise for you to tell your wife. Remember, like we established the other time, that God tells his secrets to his friend. And the Holy Spirit probably has also told your wife, if she is spiritually discerning. So you see the kind of peace you're going to enjoy when you both have the instruction. But you can imagine the two more you will be in. If you are a wife in that scenario, your husband cannot discern anything. So this sister now is standing with this brother that she was considering and the man was commenting. That's the offering you want to give? That was the end of that uh, consideration. Consideration ended there immediately. Say this one does not understand spiritual things. Time is... Is literally up and I will not be able to continue. But I think I have done justice to the second point. And the third point was supposed to be that the person must be spiritually mature and have the capacity to marry. Okay, if we had time, we would have discussed in detail what spiritual maturity is all about. Just the way we discussed what a fake Christian looks like. Hmm? fake Christians. If you're not a fake Christian, you're on your path to spiritual maturity. And we would have discussed it in great detail so that you know that the person you have to marry must be spiritually mature. I already alluded to that when I said the person must be spiritual. That marriage should be embarked on only by people who are spiritual. And who are the people who are spiritual? People who live their lives, what? In tune with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, you have a lot of you. You don't know these things, especially brothers. You want to marry. The lady you want to marry is not spiritually matured. She may, sometimes you don't even know whether she's born again. Okay, if she's born again, she's not spiritually matured. Or he's not spiritually matured. The person does not... I don't want to go there. I've seen all kinds of things. All kinds of things. Somebody wants to marry a wife. She doesn't believe in so many things that are fundamental to Christianity. Does not even understand baptism of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongue. Because the person is coming from a background where they don't understand that concept. And you want to marry the person. What is wrong with you? Because the person is what? What's, 
You have so many other reasons you want to marry the person. The most important one, which is spiritual maturity, is not playing a factor in your mind as to whether this person is qualified to be married to you or not. I've seen all, brothers do this thing a lot. I think maybe sisters too do it. You ask them, when they even mention the church the person is going to, you will be weak first. I don't want to stand there and castigate any church. That's not the purpose of what I'm saying. But many times, when you're interacting, you mention the church, you'll just be weak. The person is going to this church. How? How will the person see anything from a spiritual point of view? Because in that church, they don't see things from that point of view. So what are you talking about? Say, the person is born again. Hey, is that all? And when you are explaining this thing to people, they can never understand. Can never understand. How do you want to marry such a person? I told you the story of my friend who married and said he didn't know now to go to church is problem. That's exactly what will happen. All right. I don't have time to elucidate more. I have to stop here now. I hope you've heard something and you have learned something this evening. God bless you. believe we can do better than that. Have you been blessed? Can you celebrate Jesus if you have been blessed? Celebrate Jesus. You know, the prayer I have for you is that you will not be a hearer of the, this word. You will be a doer. Jesus we say that there are two kinds of builders. The wise builder, who is the one who hears the word of God and does it. And the foolish one who hears and does nothing with it. He said, as you build, the issue is not building. <laughs> it's what will become of the building. You may even build with that foundation. In fact, you will be the first to raise the thing high and everybody will be praising you. But the Bible says that when that house falls, I just, I wish that Jesus even only said that the house fell. But he said, great. And you know when Jesus says great, you will know that that great is more than the greatness of the dictionary. He said, great was the fall. What are you building your life on? He said, make the tree good. Make the tree good. The issue is not to focus on the fruit. It's to focus on the making. The word there is still make. Matthew chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 7 that Dr. Red. He said, make the tree good and the fruit will be good. And Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. You lack capacity to make yourself. Will you trivialize the things you are hearing today? You see, it were better you didn't hear these things because your hearing them has implicated you. You're hearing them as, you see, it means that your own judgment will be severe. <laughs> Don't be a church goer. Don't just be somebody who is, see, church is not club. <laughs> church is not, uh, what do they call it? It's not a social gathering. You know, some of you come to church, you think that the church is a social gathering. Church is not, the church is not a social gathering. It's a living organism. Be serious with your life. Be serious with your life. And that part of seriousness means even selecting your association wisely. The Bible says, any believer is not, who is not serious, know not to eat. 
And if you cannot eat with somebody, how dare you think of marrying the person? 